groups. It's all yours, Howard. Thank you, Disney. Good morning. I am excited and delighted to be here. I was particularly excited when I walked in and I saw the reserved for madness signs. I thought, okay, these are my people. <clears throat> Tried to sit over there, but they, they put me over here. <clears throat> I think, and, and I know that many of you uh, also feel that this is an exciting um, and tremendously exhilarating time uh, to be a learner. Uh, whether you are privileged like we are with our big screens and our broadband connections, or you are maybe somebody who's barefoot, doesn't have a, access to a brick and mortar school, but, but you do have a mind and curiosity and an internet cafe or a, or a smartphone, there's tremendous ferment happening in learning. Technology is really at the center of it, but it's not about technology alone. It's really about the emergence of a new culture of learning. And you'll notice that I use the word learning. I want to disassociate it from its institutionalization in education. I don't pretend to know the answers to what's happening uh, with those institutions, but I think clearly there's going to be a, a strong connection uh, between the, the kind of learning that people are doing uh, around the world now in many, many uh, ways, many ages around many topics, and those institutions. Um, in fact, uh, there's a really good new book just out by uh, Doug Thomas and, and John C. Lee Brown about a new culture of learning, and, and I would commend that to you. I think many of you may be thinking that you are not in the learning business, but if you are designing devices or services that have to do with humans changing their behavior, whether that's the way they, they uh, consume energy or it has to do with healthcare uh, practices, health practices, uh, emergency response, they're changing behavior. You're talking about learning. And I, I would contend that learning is what makes us human, and culture is, is everything that we learn from each other. We're born with some, some biological endowments, and the rest of us, the rest of it that makes us human is what we learn from and teach to each other. And I just want to quickly go through some of the, the characteristics of this new culture of learning, and I'm going to come back and, and tell you about how I learned about them. It's learner-centered now, and a lot of the technology affordances are what make that possible. It's not necessarily school-centered or teacher-centered. In fact, as I'll explain, I'm getting away from this notion of the, the teacher and the student. I think that we are all learners, and I consider myself the chief learner when I'm in a classroom. It's self-directed. There are requirements in a lot of our educational institutions, but for the most part, we now have the opportunity and the power to direct our own learning in many, many ways. It is increasingly social and peer-to-peer. -peer. There is a, a place, there will always be a place for skilled facilitators, but I don't think that learning is, is going to depend on the presence of a teacher. I think that co-learners, and I will show you how some of that's being done, are beginning to put together our, our own learning and we're learning from each other, whether you think about it in those terms or not, when we're on Twitter, when we're on Facebook, when we're communicating with each other and sharing information, sharing tags. I think that that's very central to, to learning. Well, we need to stop thinking about learning as being detached from our daily lives. It's really what humans do. And it's networked. Uh, not only are we networked with each other around the world, we're networked with all of the resources that are available uh, online. And our learning can take advantage of that. You know, it's amazing, 1995, when I was helping to launch Hotwired, first webzine for Wired magazine, 
the, we had a, a whole day of editorial meetings about the idea that we would have a column in which a person would write about something and use links um, in that. Um, and if, it's hard to, to remember why we argued all day about something like that, but every day, every minute, most of us are fluent in linking resources to what we're, we're speaking about and giving those links uh, to others. And it's inquiry-based. We're not going to abandon the need to have knowledge, to transfer facts, to, to, uh, to have the answers. But increasingly, learning, and I hope education, has to do with asking questions. So much of what we're dealing with changes so rapidly and is so contextually dependent that answers are nowhere near as important as knowing how to inquire. How not to just ask a question that has an answer, but ask a question that leads to an exploration. And it's collaborative. Um, we're working together. You know what, uh, the, the culture of schools, of course, regards a lot of collaboration as cheating. Increasingly, we're not going to be able to handle our work and our learning without collaborating. I don't need to sell that to you. You all collaborate on a daily basis. You know, I, I feel like I started out in this excitement about learning um, with a covered wagon, and now I've got my own 747. And, and I know that any of you who are uh, approaching as old as I am know this, this feeling of acceleration that, that we've gone through. Um, the covered wagon in the 1980s was a 2400 baud modem and a, a black and white screen. Uh, there wasn't an internet, and it was just text. But it was tremendously exciting to me as a learner. I wrote this, this article in 1987. You can still find it online if you, if you look for it. And you'll see if you read this article that learning from each other, sharing the information we, we find individually on our journeys, with each other was one of the things that excited me the most. In 1995, the NEC Corporation asked me to help them come up with a demonstration for the ITU conference. They have this very big conference in Geneva every two years. Probably many of you uh, go to that. I think there's something like um, 200,000 people went to it. And they wanted to demonstrate what learning might look like in the future. So I uh, asked a friend of mine, Abby Don, who has uh, better graphic skills than I, to, to mock up what that might look like. So remember, 1995, we're still dealing with modems. We're, we're not always on yet. Uh, I think like 22.5 20, was the, the speed. But it was pretty clear if you were watching what was happening that the, the, the chips and, and the pipes and the interfaces were, were going to become much more powerful and that these quantitative changes were going to lead to qualitative changes in the way we access knowledge and each other. So it, this looks a little bit like a Facebook uh, profile these days. And the idea is that there, you would have streaming video. You would have uh, incoming and, and outgoing video. You would have access to, to media out there and, and what was not yet called the, the cloud, and you would be able to find mentors, um, other learners, and, and put together uh, courses uh, on your own from wherever you were in the world. You know, even with this kind of vision, uh, it, it never occurred to me that you might be able to do that on a telephone. I envisioned the idea of, of, of having a, a kind of round tables in which people could come together and have asynchronous multimedia discussions, you know, very much like the kinds of discussion boards that, that we see today. And uh, I did a little bit of a mock-up of what that was supposed to look like. And again, it looks like a discussion board today. The radical idea then was that each post would be like a little web page. And you could put graphics on it and, and you know, maybe even a link to videos. The idea of being able to embed media in a, in a post was, was still uh, quite a ways ahead of us. So then jump ahead again, I found myself in a classroom about seven years ago that was actually kind of an accident 
a friend of mine invited me to join a learning group to help him have a, a, a they called it reading groups at, at University of California. About participatory media and collective action, kind of Smart Mobs 101, and I thought, great, I would love to talk about my book with college students. Uh, one of my students, Dana Boyd, you, you, many of you probably know her, decided she wanted to get credit for that uh, course, so she talked to the dean and turned it into a course. So suddenly, um, without really volunteering for it, I found myself as a, uh, a college uh, teacher, and I did not have any idea what I was doing. I would face students like this. Notice that half of them are looking at their laptops. And I'm, I'm really not going to take blame for how bored they, they looked. Um, they had many, many years of training in being bored. They had many years of training of uh, sitting in, in rows and columns and, and having people talk um, at them. Uh, one of the things that I did um, almost immediately was, was to start talking to them about their experience and how that experience uh, might improve. Uh, the way I put it was, if you were, if you were doomed to repeat this course again, um, what would we do more and what would we do less? And it took them a while to actually believe that I wanted to know what they were thinking, and from that began to iterate uh, how to, to teach. And since the course was on participatory media, I used participatory media. And later, a few years later, developed a course at Stanford on uh, social media, uh, which uh, I was invited to also teach at Berkeley. And so I started using wikis and, and message boards, uh, uh, blogs from a lot of different vendors, so I used a, a social text wiki, I used a, a, a Drupal blog, and, and one of the things the students told me when I asked them was that I was asking them to learn new things, that's what you do in a college course. I was also asking them to use all of these different media, that was adding a little bit to the burden, but they also needed to master different user interfaces, and each one of them had a separate login, and they felt that each one of those was a little bit of a, an obstacle, and, and a lot of small obstacles add up to a, a lot of confusion. It's, it's hard to put yourself in that beginner's mind um, if you are as accustomed to these technologies as, as we are. But for students, believe it or not, it's a new thing. Do not believe the myth of the, the digital native. Uh, all young people, even though They've got their laptops, and they've, they've got their phones, and they can text with, with one hand. That does not necessarily mean they all know what they're doing, whether they understand the rhetoric of, of blogging or how to collaborate on a wiki. I was surprised um, by that. So I started putting together some Drupal modules. I am nowhere near as, as adept as uh, necessary to do that on my own. I realized that this was a uh, was beyond me, and so when I heard that the, uh, the MacArthur Foundation uh, was sponsoring a competition, I entered the competition, was, won an award, which I spent on a Drupal developer to help me put together what I called the social media uh, classroom. So if you go to socialmediaclassroom.com, you can, you can download it and, and install it on your server. Uh, if you don't have a uh, a, a server, uh, we, we can host that uh, for you. And there are a number of resources that I have provided for other um, learners and, and educators uh, on that site. And one of the things I, I learned is uh, what uh, educators call uh, scaffolding. It's not just enough to make the tool available to educators. I needed to show them how to use these media in the context of the classroom. So as I developed lesson plans around using forums and blogs and, and wikis, social bookmarking, uh, RSS, Twitter, all the things that probably all of us here do every day, I, I'm, I've made these available to um, other teachers. And other teachers are certainly aware of what's happening in the world of social media, but how that fits in with, with the classroom is not something 
that they are, are particularly told. It's, it's, it's pretty new. At the University of California, at the, at the iSchool there, they're beginning to adopt this. This was something that a, a couple of teachers at the iSchool uh, created out of the social media classroom. Part of the, the impetus for creating this with free and open source software was to encourage others to adapt it. They created what they call the lecture page that uses tags to bring together all of the blog posts, forum posts, social bookmarks, and lecture notes about a particular uh, lecture or a particular class session. So each of these different media have a different voice. And that voice is how we expand that learning from the old uh, banking model in which, uh, very much like this, uh, students sit silently in rows while the teacher imparts knowledge. And a lot of assumptions there, the assumptions are, you don't know, I know, and that the way for you to know is for, for me, for the most part, to tell you. So the, uh, this is the forum, this is a uh, index page for a forum, and to me, a forum is for group voice. It's where we build a culture of conversation that extends beyond our classroom discussions. So if we do it right, when it's time for that bell to ring and people to move to their next class, we're in the middle of a discussion. And that discussion should not end there. It should continue through the week until the next class, or in, in, in fact, through the term. And, the, and a forum is a place to do that. And what I emphasize is that this is not a place to show off that you've done the readings. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of classroom discussion really has to do with um, cold calling on students to, to, um, to put the fear of being cold called on them, make sure that they do the readings. I'm more interested in cultivating an inquiry into the topics that the readings introduce. And this gives us an opportunity to do it. You know, there are, are, are many students who, given the time to think of something to say, they're not on the spot. And nobody's looking at them. They're in their dorm room uh, by themselves uh, with their computer. They have things to say. And the culture of conversation, the group voice, really has to do with creating a discussion that's greater than the sum of the individual comments. We're not just showing off what we know, we are inquiring. And of course, um, all of the blog posts, all of the forum posts and, and the wiki pages can have embedded videos in them. Every, every medium that's available to us online is available to us in this networked discussion sense uh, in the social media classroom. So this is a blog page here, and I just showed you that, that you can embed uh, anything you want into a blog page. And, and the voice for a blog, at least for my, my students, is that's the place for individual voice. It's not individual voice in the sense of performing for the teacher. You know, for the most part, many students write papers. The teacher is the only person who sees it. They're blogging for each other, but it's also a reflective voice. Instead of the group being the center of the voice. It's what Barry Wallman would call networked individualism. Each one of them has a voice. A lot of discussions happen not just in the forums, but in the comment threads from the blogs. But it's the individual blogger who really sets the context for those discussions. And the other aspect of that is reflection. I ask the students, to not just show that they've done the readings and they understand what they're about, but to reflect upon what they mean to them, uh, to their communities, to their society, to the future. You know, it's, I am not teaching ancient Greek. I'm not uh, teaching engineering. I'm teaching social media. This is something in which the students are immersed in their personal lives, as well as increasingly their professional lives. Uh, Right after class, they're going to go Facebook. During class, they're going to be Facebooking. Uh, after they leave the university, they are going to be living in a world of social media. So it's something that requires reflection, 
common English word. It's nothing you need to know, apparently, in order to get into Stanford or Berkeley. It's nothing that people are really taught to do in the education system. This shows you how quickly things are moving. So the social media classroom, the original design was in 2008, and I put chat in as a back channel. Twitter had really not grown to the extent that it has now uh, when I first started thinking about this. Of course, now instead of chat, we use Twitter as the back channel uh, in the class, and, and that's a whole discussion. It, it turns out when I ask the students, I say, if, you, if you're going to have your laptop open while we are talking, I want you to contribute something to the, to the back channel uh, that's projected on the screen that, that is relevant to our discussion. And suddenly the discussion kind of sludged down, both the, the verbal discussion and the, and the online discussion. I said, what's happening here? And, and the student said, it's hard to do this. And we talked about that in the forums uh, afterwards. It turns out that multitasking in class means withdrawing some of your attention from the teacher and from the, the other students in order to do that. And, and they all know that. And in fact, to my surprise, about half the students in the forum discussion said that they would welcome me controlling their use of their laptops to some degree. So that's a whole other topic. Um, what I have done is not control it, but draw their attention to it and, and use a number of different probes with the intention of creating a kind of internal observer that, that is aware of how they are deploying their attention. Um, sometimes in a class of 60 students, I will say five of you can have your laptop open at any one time, and it's up to you to, to negotiate that. Um, uh, sometimes I have somebody ring a chime and uh, ask people to simply note where their attention is. The idea simply is um, not control, but awareness, mindfulness, or metacognition. Wikipedia has a great uh, entry on metacognition. Simply being aware of what you're doing, I think, is the first step of being able to de deploy media mindfully. Uh, most teachers are in denial uh, about this, or they, they ban it outright, and of course I can't. I'm teaching social media. Um, so a wiki is part of it. The wiki is for the, the collaborative work that's a little bit difficult for students to master at first. They are trained to do individual work and to compete with each other. Uh, doing collaborative work that does not have a, an author is kind of new to them. So the entire syllabus is on a wiki, and we do wiki work as, as, as part of uh, the curriculum. Uh, social bookmarks, again, uh, Instead of asking the students to join Delicious, we have a, 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 a native form of social bookmarking. I think of the social media classroom in this context as kind of an on-ramp to, to Web 2.0. That ultimately, the learners ought to be able to create their own social media classroom. They should be able to use the forums, the, the blogs, the services like uh, Flickr, Delicious, and YouTube that are available out there. And it's amazing that these things are available uh, for free. Uh, Yahoo makes some money uh, because I'm in, in increasing their value. When I tag something, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Some people call this Playbor. Uh, for, for me, as long as I know that that's what's going on, that's fine with, with me. Um, we also have mocked up how an internal Twitter would look like. So I spent all the money I got from <coughs> MacArthur, and um, I'm out of development money. I would uh, uh, welcome any, any Drupal developers who want to volunteer time to move this to Drupal 6 and begin uh, evolving it uh, a little more. Um, as I'm sure you all know, getting one of these things to work is just the beginning. When you start working with it, all kinds of things that need to be improved and all kinds of great additions uh, come to mind, and I'm hoping to, uh, to move on that. So Haystack, the organization that uh, sponsored uh, the competition, had a discussion with their young scholars. And I said, well, why don't we, why don't we experiment with, with media? There is uh, an application of, that doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, called Seismic uh, Video. That was a video BBS. It was um, a 
a startup before its time, somebody out there needs to, one of you, needs to recreate it. We really need to have a, a, a video BBS. And I think one of the reasons Seismic died was that they did not have the capability of creating private groups. I want to be able to designate who can hop into my conversation. So this is just to show you here what, what this kind of conversation looks like, sounds like. Hello, this is Howard Reingold. I've been asked to say a few words you, about- You can see the thumbnails across the bottom. Hi, Bruno. Uh, thank you for joining the conversation. Um, there is a link. Click on a thumbnail and you get a response. Um, click on reply, you get an authentication box and you can, you can then uh, reply. Notice that while that video is going horizontally, we have a normal text threaded conversation that, that's going vertically. This is just a, a demonstration of what's possible. Uh, there are contexts in which this kind of discussion is perfectly appropriate. We need to experiment to discover that. So back to the classroom. Um, this class at Berkeley, at the end of the semester at Berkeley, the student collaborative projects presented. Instead of having a final exam, the students presented their projects. And then we had a discussion about how can we improve this. And one of the first things, we, we were all blown away by these presentations, by the way. They were magnificent. And when I asked how could we improve this, the students said, why don't you move the, the, the student presentations up earlier? Uh, and from that came the idea of why not, not just do presentations, why not have the students uh, help teach as well? The other thing we discovered was that if you look at these two classrooms, look at the difference in, in engagement and look at the way the chairs are arranged. So I have a classroom that's, that's um, open, the chairs are stacked, and on the first day of class, I kind of stand on the sidelines and the students come in, they pull the chairs up and, and invariably, I bet on it. They put those chairs into, into rows and columns. And if I don't intervene, they will come back the next week and sit where they, they happen to sit the first time. And so I just stumbled on this, trying to get conversation going. We moved the chairs in a circle and the conversations exploded. Um, I discovered this. I wasn't the person to in, invent this. Of course, when I started looking into it, Harrison o Owen, who does the open space uh, technology, talks about the, the power of the circle. There is no back row in a circle. Um, and you, everybody is facing somebody else. It's an enormous uh, difference. And that power dynamic that is um, inscribed in the classroom is radically changed. You know, if you took a warrior from a thousand years ago, and you put them on a battlefield today, they die quickly. Um, if you took a surgeon from a thousand years ago and you put them in an operating theater today, they would be lost. You took a professor from a thousand years ago, you put them in a classroom today, they would know exactly where to go and they would know exactly what went on. It's what, 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 um, uh, it's the, the, the kind of script that uh, sociologist uh, uh, Irving Goffman would call the working consensus. You walk into a classroom, you know what's going to go on there, and what's going to go on there is not that we're going to engage each other, it's that we're going to absorb whatever the teacher throws at us. Notice also, uh, you don't see me here, you don't see who's standing and talking, it's a student, and they're looking at each other and they're engaged with each other. So what I've learned to do is on the first day of classes, I write the themes up on the whiteboard all around the, the classroom. So my themes are um, identity and presentation of self, uh, community, uh, social capital, collective action, all of the issues that arise from the use of social media and introducing the texts and the discourses around those, those issues. And I ask the students to cluster around the, the issue that, that most excites them. In fact, 
I demand that the students read the syllabus before the first day of class. At Stanford, they let me get away with this. I demand that the students read the syllabus and write to me and make a commitment to participate in this way before they get into the class. So they know what to expect, and presumably, they know what the readings are about, even if they haven't done them yet. And then those teams of students who cluster around those topics, they become the co-teaching teams. In fact, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to call them the co-learning teams next. And so they work with me uh, for about a third of the class. And their job is not to try to convey everything that's in the text. Their, their job is to find something that they think is important and excites them and convey that importance and involve the other students in their excitement. And it's tremendously exciting. I tell them this class is really about cooperative learning in ways that you've never experienced before. But the one place I want you to compete is I want you to compete for having the most engaging, the most exciting co-teaching. And they come up with all kinds of things. They, they, they create a, a, a Jeopardy game. When we're talking about identity, they have people sign up for an instant messaging service under a pseudonym. And then they hand out little slips of paper that say, um, I'm a 14-year-old girl. I'm a 50-year-old guy pretending to be a 14-year-old girl. I'm a, a hacker uh, somewhere in the world. And then people uh, I am with those pseudonyms and try to somehow convey their identity by the, by the way they communicate. They come up with all kinds of stuff that, that surprises me. And I work with them. They need to come up with a plan. We discuss it in the forums. They meet with me in my office hours. I, I overlapped with my daughter at Stanford for one year. And I sat in my office, as I'm required to do, and students didn't show up that first year. And I asked her, and she said, well, only math and, and uh, physics students go to office hours to work on problem sets. So I require the students to come in with their teams, to come up with a co-teaching plan. And they're tremendously excited about it. I'm helping to turn the teaching over to them more and more. I am there to create the boundaries and to facilitate what goes on. But the more I shut up, the more learning um, happens. So one of the things that we do is the, the co-teaching team uh, identify words and phrases from the texts, from our discussions. They add them to the wiki in real time as they come up during the, the class session. And then during the week, between that class session and the next class session, it's up to everybody in the course to define those words. And it's a little bit difficult for them at the beginning, but I do a little bit of, of coaching on that. I identify um, definitions that need a little bit of expansion. If the definition is not quite right, I don't correct it, but I tell them that they need to work on it. And then at the beginning of the next class meeting, I show them the revision history. So this is a collective action problem. I tell them. You know, two or three of you can do all of the work, and the rest of you can free ride on it. But you, you can notice in the revision history each week who those two or three are. I also talk about something that I think is increasingly important in social production, which is self-election. You decide whether you want to define a word or, or just reformat the page. And they catch on. They get pretty excited about it, and now, the answer, or at least one of the answers to um, what's going to be on the test is, well, it depends. What are you going to put in the wiki? And the test consists of writing a narrative that uses as many of the words from the lexicon um, in context as you can. To me, assessment ought to be about learning. There's more, more to be learned about that, and, and I'm getting into it. I also ask the co-teaching teams to present a mind map next week of what they did last week. So one of the things you do in a, a course like this, you move over material very, very rapidly. And, um, and I want them to connect each week to the previous week, and I want them to use uh, nonlinear media. So they use mind maps. Um, I tell the students that I'm going to give them several different ways of looking at. I'm going to give them several kinds of conceptual frameworks to use for understanding these different topics. 
and I literally give them different ways of looking at the syllabus. It's, uh, the identical material is on a wiki, also a concept map. If you click on the little document icons there, you will get the, 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 the text, and also as a Prezi. I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware of Prezi. So students have their choice of how they look uh, through this. So this, uh, in the last few months, I've moved uh, totally out of the educational institution as we know it in my exploration. I created Rheingold U. It was just kind of a, an experiment, but it's become extremely exciting. I just put out a, a question on Twitter. Who would, who would pay $100 to participate in a five-week course um, with me? And it was magical. Uh, well, for one thing, uh, there's a huge difference between a required course and one in which uh, someone pays $100 uh, to participate, and they're volunteering, and they're not going to get any uh, credit for it. And for some reason, it occurred to me that when I started addressing these folks, I started calling them co-learners. And it, it sounds a little hokey, but it's amazing how they took to that. And in fact, we are teaching each other, and I learn a great deal um, every time. Um, so uh, my first course was on introduction to mind amplifiers. I introduced them to that history that most people don't know about with uh, JCR Licklider and Alan Kay and Doug Engelbart. Where did all these things come from and why do we have the technologies we're using? But also we talk about a lot of the techniques uh, as well. I also use a real-time platform in addition to this uh, asynchronous social media classroom. I use Illuminate. Uh, I like it a lot. Doesn't cost very much. Cost me $50 a month for up to 50 uh, seats in this. I I'm not so happy that it's owned by Blackboard and that it's, it's proprietary. Um, but it enables me to stream audio and video. Um, all of the, you, you can see that there's a, probably about uh, 20 co-learners in the class. They can also take over the microphone. They can, we can also have up to five of us have video at the same time. You, you see a little delicious screen there. That's because I'm doing some screen sharing. There's a whiteboard. We do a mind mapping on the whiteboard, which is kind of magical because words appear and circles and boxes and lines connecting them. But it's not clear who's doing it. It's the group doing it, and it just kind of uh, emerges. And there's also a text chat that goes on. So if I mention uh, Doug Engelbart, somebody can go and, and look it up and, and uh, paste in a URL uh, for others there. And then this is all recorded, and it's replayable by people later. There is an open source version of this under development called Big Blue Button that's used by P2PU. And it's got almost everything. It still needs to be developed. You can't uh, quite record it uh, yet. But as you can see, free and open source uh, and available tools for, for the kinds of learning that were never uh, really possible just a few years ago are now um, becoming available. And there's a, a long way to go in making these easier to use, easier to install, and easier for teachers and learners to understand how to use them. So I'm, I'm hoping some of you will join me on this. I, I create, with, with somebody who's better at HTML than I, I create these little mini courses that I can embed for people to, to use later. My model is all of this is open. All of the mini courses, all of the texts, all of the recordings are freely available. What you pay for is to participate in a learning community for a period of time with me. And so if you, there are a couple of videos. You click on the tabs, you get a video here. Um, you can see uh, the latest links that come from my bookmarks that are, are, are tagged. In this case, it's about networks. 55,000 people have accessed that, that little learning uh, module there. So Rheingold U is just my little experiment. I started looking around, and there's an explosion of this kind of peer learning happening out there. There's P2P. You, there's super cool school, open courseware, I'm sure you're all aware of. We've got all of the elements of something new and exciting uh, emerging uh, around the world. And I think we're really at the beginning of it. It's a little bit like the web in 1995, I think. And there's a long way uh, to go. OK, I want to zoom back here and look at a very big picture. And I brought this slide 
for, for you, because I know that you are the people who are thinking about how these technologies, how these media are going to work in the future. If you look at uh, uh, what I wrote about in Smart Mobs, about collective action on the political level, of course, we're seeing that happening explosively in the Middle East and North Africa now, but also uh, culturally, the web itself, um, economically, social production, open source production, in every field, uh, we are seeing things emerge that were not possible before. And I think I have a very strong intuition, not as a UI professional, that there are affordances of the media that are available, that have enabled people to do things together that they weren't able to do together before. So when I looked into collective action theory, turns out classic collective action theory will tell you that Wikipedia and open source are not possible. Clearly, something has changed. And I think it's because of these affordances. So this is just off the top of my head. And I challenge you. I think there are probably more of these top level characteristics. And I just kind of uh, described some of what those characteristics are. I think that there are, are, are more. Uh, there are fuller and more technical descriptions. And I think, ultimately, if we understand what the design principles are that enable people to do things together in new ways, with people they weren't able to do things with before, at paces and in places they weren't able to engage in collective action before, we're going to see even more explosive growth in valuable services, everything from learning to disaster response to feeding the, the people in the world. And you are the people who are going to be building those next generation platforms. And I think somebody can come up with a theory of how this works. So thank you for the gift of your attention. I appreciate it. And I think we've got a couple minutes here for questions and answers. Great. Thank you so much, Howard. Um, oh, we're not doing that yet. OK, so thank you all for the questions. Uh, we're only going to have time to try to put a couple of these to Howard. But Howard will be around the conference today, so I encourage you to look for him and come. Uh, and we will deliver all of the questions to Howard. So first, uh, the, a question from Amy Bruckman at Georgia Tech. Howard, I'm struck by the contrast between your wonderful optimism and joy in this technology and Sherry Turkle's caution that we are using social media to avoid people physically present, that we are alone together. How do you reconcile this? You know, not everything needs to be reconciled. Humans are, we're good and we're bad and we're, and we're, we're alienating and we, we, we celebrate our, 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 our togetherness. Um, I think the missing element is literacy. Um, do you know? Are you mindful of what you're doing? Should you really be looking at your Blackberry or should you be looking at your five-year-old? Um, those are things that are not intrinsic to the technology, although everybody here is familiar with affordances and, and these technologies that call to our attention. They afford alienation. I would agree with her to that degree. But I also think that some of those people who may be acting in, an, in, in what she perceives as to be an alienating way, they are actually connecting um, with other people. They, you know, young people, they don't know everything. Adolescents don't have a, a whole lot of knowledge of, of moral development or how or societal expectations. We're in a whole new territory. We need to, to learn how to do that. I strongly believe that it's important to interrogate our technologies and to be mindful of how we use them and to understand that there are prices to be paid for what we gain from our technologies. And I'll, I'll, I'll add only one more thing. I am not an optimist. I'm a little bit too old and too educated about what people do to each other to be optimistic. But I am hopeful. Um, and that's a choice. Um, if, you, if you are really not optimistic, you need to become a nihilist. And if you're going to become a nihilist, you don't get old. A good nihilist <laughs> does not live long. 
So you need to make a choice. And I choose to be hopeful. And you know what? We are all descendants of creatures who said there must be some way out of this impossible situation. And that's my attitude. Great. Okay. Howard, there are gobs of questions here. We don't have time for any more, but there's one, one question that we want to leave you with that you said you didn't anticipate social media on the phone seven years ago, but right now, if you were to project seven years in the future, what do you see as the next big thing? Okay, I did seven years ago. I wrote Smart Mobs 10 years ago. 10 years yeah. ago. <laughs> Thank you. But in 1995, with 22.5 modems, um, it, it was impossible to believe. So what, what do I think is going to happen in seven years? You know what, the, the event horizon has come really, really, really close. When I started out doing this stuff, I went to places like Xerox Park, and it was pretty easy to see where the rest of the world was going with the technology. But not only do we have multiple technologies that are intersecting and affecting each other, but we have, what is it, five billion mobile phones, two billion people on the internet, every day inventing new things, not just coming from Bell Labs and Xerox Park and IBM anymore, it's coming from 14-year-olds in Brazil. So I've, I've given up on trying to predict where that's going. What I think the critical uncertainty is, is what we know. And that this has happened before when people uh, learned to write. It happened before with the, the printing press. There's the technology that enables a new form of communication. And then there's the literacy. How do we use this? How do I read? How do I write? What does that mean? And what both of these questions reflect is that the technologies have gotten way ahead of the literacy. So since this is the last question, I will plug the book I'm working on now that I will hope to have available a year from now about social media literacies. What I have understood that my students and the people that I know need to know, attention, participation, crap detection, collaboration, and network awareness. And we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so Thank much. You. Okay. Okay, well, that was the fun part. Now we have to go uh, back and tell you a few more things. Uh, I'm Wendy Kellogg, Technical Program Chair with Bo Begol, and uh, we just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview about uh,